Friends, today we'll be discussing about how to prepare for urology entrance examination. So this is a very important presentation. In today's competitive examination era, there is no role for just reading and remembering. You also have to be smart in answering the entrance examination questions that are asked. Most of these questions are single answer MCQ types and there is a way on in which you should answer these MCQs that increases the chances of you getting the correct response in these questions. There are some questions which are true or false or assertion reason type or in which multiple answers are correct. These are questions which are more difficult to answer and require you to have a thorough knowledge of the base uh, information or the base theory. So while there is no excuse or no alternative to having a thorough reading of the base study material, answering the questions and how you answer the MCQ questions can make a difference between you cracking the exam and having to prepare for the next session. So in this presentation, we will discuss the key tips and tricks of answering the MCQ entrance examination. Along with that, we'll have a brief look at the table of contents of the Campbell textbook of urology, which will be our base reading material. And we'll discuss what are the important topics in each chapter that you should focus on. So why you should prepare for urology? The first and foremost thing that should be a prerequisite for preparing for urology is your interest in the subject. I have known people who have been preparing for the subject of not, which is not of their choosing, but they've been told by their seniors or by their family that either the later prospects in the clinical work are maximum in this field or the number of seats are maximum in their in a specific field or the chances of them getting through are maximum in a specific field and they prepare for that subject but unfortunately they are not able to go through. But if they start preparing for their subject of interest, there are chances that they will be able to crack the entrance examination. Also, unless you have the interest in the subject, just by cracking the examination, you are not likely to succeed later in life. And our first and foremost aim is to make sure that we are able to practice what we are studying later in life because our whole professional life will go in practicing this subject which we are preparing for. So interest in urology is the most important reason why you should be preparing for urology. Urology is the top super specialty branch. I consider urology and GI surgery as uh, probably the top two branches followed closely by oncology if you ask me in surgical super specialty. But even among them, urology I would say ranks at number one. It is an ever advancing branch. There are advances not only in the medical management of urological diseases, there are advances in the surgical management of urological diseases as well. So this is a combination of medical and surgical branch. Even in urology now there are a huge number of subspeciality branches that you can find and do fellowships in. You have laparoscopic urology, robotic urology, uro-oncology, reconstructive urology, you have endo-urology, stone surgeries, you have neuro-urology, you have female urology and you have andrology. Some of these branches are more towards the medical side. For example, you have andrology or you have neurourology, they are more towards medical side. You have branches which are more towards surgical side, especially if you go in robotics or oncology. So you get a mix of both medical and surgical cases in this branch and that is a special feature of urology in the other surgical branches. Now, as you discussed, there are is a huge opportunity for subspecialization in urology and you can choose your subspeciality of interest within the urology uh, broad field and you can direct your practice in that subspecialization. Another important thing or a preferred thing I would say for some people is that there are limited emergencies in urology. Limited surgical emergencies I would say most of the emergencies in urology can be managed with a simple catheter placement. The most common uh, emergency you will find in urology is urinary retention of course and that can be managed with a careful urinary catheter placement. Sometimes there can be hematuria, again it can be managed with catheter placement, clot evacuation and bladder irrigation. Very rarely you will find that patient has come to you and requires an emergency surgical management. Those are rare cases like testicular torsion or penile fractures. So those patients who want um, relatively less hectic life may 
also be drawn towards urology. Unlike GI surgery, unlike hepatobiliary surgery, unlike neurosurgery or cardiac surgery, you will find that urology is a much less taxing branch compared to these other branches, but that does not mean that urology is any less. In fact, I would rank it at number 1 as we just discussed. Now, another important thing about urology is that an individual practice as well as teamwork is possible in urology. So, in certain branches, I would say in oncology for example, you need a collaborative work. You need surgical oncology, a lot of patients may need chemotherapy which will need a medical oncologist and a lot of them may need radiotherapy which will need a radiotherapist for a proper patient management. But in urology, if you want to do individual practice, you can do it. If you want to be a endo-urologist, you want to do freelancing, you can do it. And if you want to do teamwork, you want to do uro oncology, you want to do robotic surgery, you want to be in an institute, you want to be an academic professor, you can be that in urology as well. So, it is a well rounded branch. So, the main examinations that we are focusing on are the institutes of national importance like AIMS, PGI, and the SGPGI, which are the top. Uh, urological programs in the country. Along with that, you have the need super specialty entrance examination from which you can get entrance into various MCH and DNP programs in urology in the country. So, how do you start preparing for entrance in urology? So, you need to divide the topics of urology into those which are really important which you need to know by heart and those which are of less importance. The questions are asked in lesser frequency from these other topics and we want to do smart reading. We do not need to do the whole reading, we need to do smart reading because the time is limited. Between the entrance examination of one and the other, especially in AIMS, SGPG and PJ, will find they have twice yearly examinations you will find that hardly you will get 4 months for preparation before the next examination comes. And these 4 months should be spent in making sure that these high yield topics are by heart, the previous year questions are by heart, so that you can get the maximum out of your preparation instead of doing the whole Campbell which might not be that high yielding. So, you can divide the topics into tier 1 topics and tier 2 topics. So, tier 1 topics we will include the general urology, a lot of questions come from urological radiology, urological instruments, basics of urology, urological examination, routine examination, hematuria. These general topics, infections, these make up a lot of questions in the entrance examination. Apart from that, the three main topics which are included in the tier 1 topics I would say is the kidney. Kidney malignancies, renal stones and renal physiology are extremely important and you need to know these topics by heart. Bladder and prostate which makes up the volume 3 of Campbell is of extreme importance. You will find that almost one third to one half of the entrance examination can sometime be from these two topics and there is no scope of losing out any topics in these two. Uh, specialties of bladder and prostate. In bladder, physiology of the bladder and the malignancy specialty of the bladder, the new trials in all these three oncological uh, topics of kidney, bladder and prostate. The prostate physiology, benign prostate enlargement and of course, prostate cancer are extreme favorites for entrance examination I and I feel these topics should be by heart. Another tier 1 topic that I would like to include is biostatistics which I feel is extremely high yielding and is among the favorite of examiners and I would uh, estimate that almost 5 to 6 questions you might get from biostatistics in a single entrance examination and these are mostly very high yield questions. In tier 2 you can place the other topics like adrenals, urinary incontinence, female urology and pediatric urology. Coming in tier 2 does not mean that you do not need to know these topics at all. It means that you need to know selective chapters out of these topics and the rest of these chapters you need to do from previous year questions. So, that you are able to cover all the important topics or important chapters that are included in these tier 2 topics. Now, how do you start reading? So, there are different approaches for starting the preparation. There is a book first approach which personally I prefer and you have the question first approach. So, in the book first approach what I do is a chapter wise reading of the Campbell. I have been preparing my presentations according to the book first approach as well and if you ask me personally I would recommend a book first approach. I feel that it gives you a more comprehensive overview of the subject matter and because the questions sometimes are asked from lines of the Campbell and you can get 
if you go back at Campbell after giving the entrance examination, you find that they have just taken it straight out of the textbook. If you have read the textbook somewhere on the back of the mind, you might be able to remember that option when you see it in the entrance examination. And I feel that a book first approach really makes a difference in answering the questions. So, a chapter wise reading is included in the book first approach and not a single reading usually suffices. In a single reading what I find is I just get a crux of the chapter and I am able to highlight the important lines in the chapter. Usually I use a, a pen for underlining and a highlighter for highlighting and I uh, use color coding as well. So, what I do, what I used to do in my entrance examination, I used to use a blue pen and a yellow highlighter for the first reading. Then I used to do multiple reading. In the multiple readings, you consolidate all the information and you leave out all the unnecessary information which are included in the chapter. So, on the second reading, I usually used to do a red pen along with an orange highlighter and on the third reading, I used to use a black pen with a green highlighter. So, that used to be a color coding in my mind and that used to give me confidence as well that this chapter I have read three times, this chapter I have read two times. And that also led to increased retention of these chapters in my mind. Apart from that, what I knew, used to do is make sticky notes. So, that depends on person to person. Some people like to make whole notes of the chapter. I used to find them very cumbersome. I used to find that it is very time consuming. What I used to do was use sticky notes. And in these sticky notes, I used to put the overview of the chapter and I used to make some important MCQ or the important points uh, that were included in the chapter that I need to remember or if I have read something new that is not included in Campbell but it is included in the topic. So, for example, you have read a new trial which is not there in the book but it is related to prostate cancer for example but it is not included in the prostate cancer chapter. So, I used to note it down in the sticky note. So, when I am re revising I, I could remember that this trial needs to be remembered and I used to find that during the final revision before the examination both in the entrance and the exit examination sticky notes really helped me getting the remembering the overview of the chapter because in books sometimes you find that they will give you the, the causes of uh, for example, the causes of hypocytraturia are so and so and they will list 10 causes and then they will describe each cause in detail in the coming pages. So, what you can do is you can mark them. So, in each main heading I used to mark for example, in Roman numerals then in subheadings, I used to mark them with alphabets and in further subheadings, I used to mark them in small alphabets. So, that used to give me an overview and a framework of how the uh, authors are describing the topic and during exit examination especially it helps you in recalling and answering the question in a point wise manner. And you can put these uh, 1, 2, 3 ABC in your sticky notes so that in the end you can simply remember these, these, these headings are there in the answer. So, especially for exit examination you will find that this uh, sticky notes used to really help. The other approach is question first approach. I would recommend that question first approach is mainly for tier 2 topics. So, in question first approach what you can do is you can approach the previous year questions by previous year papers. At least 5 years papers I would recommend that you should have. 5 years papers for the annual examination, 5 years papers for biannual examination which means 10 years, 10 papers. So, you need to have them and you need to know their questions and Based on these questions, you can read the topic. So, I personally prefer a question first approach only for tier 2 topics which I am not reading thoroughly by the book. Apart from that, you have some question banks that you can get from your seniors and those topics. First, you do the question and then you can answer the, uh, you can read the explanation that is given in the textbook. Advantage of this approach can be that sometimes they can get some extra points, especially in cases of question banks and previous year question books, you can find some extra points which might not be there in the book. And for tier 2 topics, that can really help. And again, for missing topics, that is the tier 2 topics, you fill in the blanks with the question first approach. So, personally, I would recommend you a book first approach. So, what are the books that you read for the entrance examination? Campbell latest edition obviously is your main textbook that you need to read. So, that latest edition or 12th edition, you must have it. Either you get the original or you get a photocopy version, but you need to have it. You cannot get the entrance examination without it. Campbell review an extremely important adjunct to the Campbell main textbook. Those tier 2 topics which are missing from the Campbell main book that you are not reading need to be thoroughly done through the Campbell review. For the main topics also I would recommend that you go through at least the MCQs if not the explanations. Previous year papers as we discussed 5 years for the annual examination, 10 papers for the biannual examinations you need to have. These are very high yield topics you cannot get them wrong. Even a single wrong answer in a previous year paper can get you a get you behind the, your competitors because these are questions that are sometimes asked verbatim and these cannot you cannot get them wrong. Another important thing that you need to remember is sometimes they ask the same question, but they change one or two options. So, you cannot simply blindly answer those questions, you need to read them. Just because they have been asked previously does not mean that they 
uh, simply copy and paste it or uh, sometimes they change one or two options and that completely changes the answer because the questioner always remember that the exam setter or the question master is smarter than you, he is more experienced than you and he is not a fool. So, he knows what you are thinking and you need to answer based on what you feel that he is going to ask you. Apart from that previous year questions I would also recommend that those uh, questions which have been asked in the previous year their options are important uh, for you to remember uh, for you to know and read because sometimes the new question comes from the options. So, for example, they have asked you that uh, pro, uh, which of the following is not a drug for metastatic prostate cancer. They have given them abiratron, enzalutamide, finasteride and the answer is finasteride and you remember that question. But they can ask the upcoming question from enzalutamide and they can ask that what is a important side effect of enzalutamide which is not seen in apalutamide and the answer will be seizures. So, uh, that what they have asked is from a previous year question, but they have asked a completely new question. But if you had read the previous year question and read the topic, we read about abiratron, enzalutamide, finasteride and metastatic prostate cancer, then you will be easily able to answer the new question that they have asked based on the previous year question. So, that is another importance of previous year questions. Now, lesson notes what we are discussing these presentations, I have tried to include all the important points from the Campbell textbook because we follow the book first approach. Apart from that, I have some included some new updates, recent updates and some points which are not included in the textbook as well. And these notes, I hope that you find them useful for your entrance examination. Apart from that, you should also take mock tests. What I used to do is I can tell you for uh, from my experience that uh, when my wife was giving an, her entrance examination, what I used to do is make uh, some mock questions for her from her textbook. So, it was uh, a little time consuming, but I really feel that it helped her and it gives you a practice of how to answer the entrance examination questions and you get into a habit of answering MCQ questions and you get into a habit of how uh, the question setter is making or setting the questions and what answer is he expecting. If you have someone, uh, your friend or a senior who is there in your institute of choice, you can ask them for help as well if they can give you some more questions because they will be knowing uh, the mindset of the question master of that institute and that can really make a difference in how you answer the MCQ. There are few important points about answering the MCQs, always and always you should try to attempt almost all of the questions. So, uh, when I used to start giving my mock test when I was preparing for the PG entrance, in the first examination, uh, in the first mock examination when I gave, I could correctly answer 60 percent of the questions and 40 percent of the questions I was not sure. Maybe I was confused between two options or three options and I left them and I used to get really low score. What I change in my approach is in the next coming entrance examination, mock entrance test, I answered all of them even if I did not know them and my score improved by almost 20 percent points. So, you should always answer all of the questions, especially you have a minus one third or minus one fourth negative marking because if you apply probability, you will find that probability is that you will get either a null score or a positive score. Your chances of getting all the questions wrong is extremely wrong and your score will almost always improve even if you answered all the options even without knowing the correct answer. I would not say that you answer 100 percent, maybe you can leave 3 to 5 questions maximum in which you are absolutely having no clue. For example, they ask a scientist name, you have no idea, you cannot make a guess also, you cannot make an informed guess, you can leave that question. But try to limit those questions that you have left to maximum 3 or 5, not more than that. If, they, if you are leaving more than that, answer it I would say and the probability will be that you will either get a null score or a positive score out of those. Uh, extra question that you have answered. So, if you have no negative marking in the entrance examination, which is usually not the case, you attempt all of them. If you have minus one fourth negative marking or 25 percent negative marking, again you attempt all. You attempt even if you cannot exclude all options because for example, you have 8 questions of which you do not know the answer, you do not exclude any option. Chances are you get 4 positive and you get 4 negative that is the 50-50 percent probability. The positive marks that you get out of 4 correct answer will overshadow the negative marking that you will get from 4 negative answer. Even if you correct un correctly answer 1 or 2 questions and the rest you answer uh, wrongly, still you will get probably a null score not a negative score. So, you do not lose anything by 
uh, answering all the questions if there is a minus 25 percent marking. If there is a minus one third marking which is usually seen in the AIMS entrance examination you attempt if you are able to exclude one option. So, if you are able to exclude one option you are confused between the other three I would say you answer the best that you can do. If you have a 50 percent negative marking you exclude two options if you are confused between two options you answer that question and in PGI for example if they have a 100 percent negative marking this is a tricky situation and in this case you should attempt only if you know the answer because if you get a wrong answer chances that you will get the score in negative. So, when you answer the MCQ always try to exclude as many options as possible because for example if you have asked a, if you have been asked a question and you go uh, you are going option A, option B, option C and find that option C is correct and you do not even look at the other options and you mark option C and you are very happy that you have answered the correct answer. But later on you will find that maybe the option D was even a better answer. So, you have to answer the best answer. It is not the correct answer that you have to mark, you have to mark the best possible answer. There might be two options which are right, but one option may be more right than the other. So, you have to look at all the options, you exclude all the options. By excluding the option, your chances of making this silly mistake is much lower. Again, you delete those options that you know are surely wrong. So, if you are confused between the option, at least you remove the option that you are sure that uh, this is not the right answer. That again increases the probability that you will get the answer right. So, like in KBC, there is a 50-50 lifeline. So, if you remove two wrong options, chances are that you will get a correct answer of the remaining two options. Then options which are having the terms like always or never or only are almost always wrong. There is never a never and always and always, nay, what was the thing? Al always is always wrong and never is never right. In biology that is what it is called. I would say that always is almost always wrong and never is almost never right in cases of entrance examination. Now, when you see a question and you see all the options, the first answer or the first option that you think is right is usually the right answer. So, go with your instincts because somewhere in the back of the mind what you have read, it holds on to you and you are able to answer the option by seeing the options. After overthinking the option, no, this is right, this is right, usually you end up marking the wrong option. So, I would say that the first option that you feel is right on after looking at all the options, the one that you instinctively feel is right is usually the right answer. Go with your instincts. Now, options which have contradictory information, for example, they said that uh, out of the two options, one have to be right. So, for example, that we will see a question later that testosterone is the main hormone in pro uh, prostate development, dihydrotestosterone is the main hormone in prostate development. Now, you know that one of them have to be right. So, probably one of them will be the answer and the other options you can exclude. And again in the question you have to be very important, very careful about next step and best step. So, usually in hematuria evaluation they can ask that the patient comes to you with gross hematuria, what will be the next step. So, there can be an option of ultrasound and there can be option of a contrast and CT. The next option will be an ultrasound because that is a lesser invasive modality as compared to CT whereas the best option will be a contrast in a CT scan. So, you should be careful about what the examiner is asking whether they are asking for the next step or they are asking for the best step. So, for example, which of the statements about androgens and the prostate are correct? So, testosterone is the primary androgen affecting prostate cell growth and dihydrotestosterone is the primary androgen affecting prostate cell growth. So, one of them is likely to be correct because you know that one of them has to be a hormone that is responsible for the prostate development. Now, men with hypogonadism never develop prostate cancer. So, as we discussed, options with never are almost never right. Other higher circulating serum levels of androgen increase the risk of prostate cancer, type 1 firefighter is now we are not sure. But if you have been able to exclude one option and you are uh, thinking that one of them needs to be the answer because one of them have to be an androgen that is affecting prostate cell growth. So, you can answer between the two and if you answer then again the probability of you getting a right answer will be increased. So, again with respect to two RCTs affecting the effect of PSA screening of prostate cancer mortality, I just wanted to highlight here that both studies clearly show no benefit. Again, this clearly always never is almost always a wrong option. So, how do you start preparing for the entrance examination? Before, for example, you have starting preparing uh, for the entrance examination now and the entrance examination is after 4 months. So, you should make a schedule. What That is what I do. I make a schedule. I On a piece of paper, I write note down the calendar. For example, I have started September 1 to uh, October, November, December. I make the whole schedule and I mark the Sundays and I mark the holidays as well. And based on the Campbell uh, table of index, uh, table of contents, I 
divide all the topics and make a schedule of how I want to read. In that schedule, I will give rest days for myself because I know that I'm not going to be able to read every day. I'm going to divide topics according to their length. That is what I do. So a long topic of 60 pages will be clubbed with a short topic of 10 pages so that overall it balances out each other. An interesting topic will be uh, club with a boring topic like anatomy topic or a physiology topic will be club with a management topic which I find more interesting so that I can balance them out. If I keep all the uh, boring topics together, I'll fall in a slump, I'll stop reading and I'll uh, be distracted instead. That is what happens to me. So I make a schedule. If I am on a schedule, then I get a kick out of ticking that box. I get uh, happy when I am able to cross off that topic of my list and that keeps me going. Again, once you make a schedule, make sure that you start a schedule a little later from the current date and you start reading from the current date. So try to start at least one week in advance of the schedule so that you are able to get some lead time on the topic that you are reading. Inadvertently, you will find that you will get more rest days than you have put in your schedule or you will not be able to read as much as you have put in your schedule. So if you have some lead time, you will feel good that yes, you are going ahead of the schedule and you will be able to do your reading. And you have to keep adequate buffer for emergencies. And what I used to get what is called as the reading block. I used to read for three, four days straight. And for two, three days, I would not be able to read at all. I'll uh, do something else entirely. And I used to get this block. So then again, I used to start reading. So this happens. You have to make sure that you have kept adequate buffer in your schedule for these emergencies. Now, every line of the textbook is important. That is the beauty of the book first approach. They can ask questions from every line of the textbook and you have to be thorough with your reading of your textbook. And in each topic, you can imagine the MCQs or you can go through the Campbell review because sometimes we read a topic and we are not able to grasp what lines are important that can be asked in the MCQ. But when you read some mock MCQs or the previous year papers from the chapter, you realize, oh, even this topic was important. Oh, even this line was important. And they've been asked questions from that. So that increases your retention power of that topic. And I would recommend that you do the MCQs at the end of each topic. So you are increasing the retention power of that topic. Now, apart from your textbook and these additional books, there is some bonus reading material that you can get from your peers and from your seniors who are already studying in your institute of choice. You can ask them for some additional bonus reading material that may, they might have. They can ask them about the important machines, for example, the lithotripsy machine or the robotic technology, if it is available in the institute, chances are that the examiners from that institute will be including these in their entrance examination. Topics of interest or types of patients that are admitted in the ward of the institute of your choice likely are that the examiners will be asking questions from those. So if your exam institute of choice is not doing pediatric urology, chances are that the entrance examination for the institute will have less amount of pediatric urology than for example, if they are doing a lot of prostate cancers. Again, every institute will have seminar topics, journal clubs for the MCH uh, academics and these topics of seminars or if you can get hold of these seminars or the journals are again a bonus reading material because these will be of interest to the faculty of that institute. Now, apart from that, there are some journals as well, especially those journals containing randomized control trials, especially those which are named like you have the promise trial, you have the precision trial, you have the future trial. So you, these trials are important for MCQs. You'll find at least four or five questions that will be coming from these new trials. They are, they are very favorites of the question masters. And these trials can be found in European Urology, Journal of Urology, which are the European and the American journals, the Indian Journal of Urology, NEGM and Lancet. NEGM and Lancet trials are especially important. So if you can get hold of them, if you have the time for them, I would say that this is a bonus reading material. Now, biostatistics, as we said earlier, is very high yield. It is a very favorite topic of entrance examination, especially of AIMS, I can tell you. And the book for biostatistics is a high yield statistics book. The book is titled High Yield Statistics. It's a small book, 100 pages, hardly a day read, and it is very high yield. You should especially know about the types of studies, survival analysis, life table analysis, kaplan meier analysis, stages of the clinical trials, a favorite of the question masters, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, what is it, and the incidence prevalence. These are the major things that may be usually asked in the entrance examination. And biostatistics, I cannot stress enough, you should definitely be aware of this topic because there is bound to be a few questions coming from biostatistics. 
apart from that you should have a hold of previous year papers you can usually get a question bank that is usually passed down from seniors to juniors. These previous year papers will be of NEET SS, AIMS, SGPJ and PJ. They are extremely high yield and there is no scope of missing any question if you want to be in the, in the competition. Now, the entrance examination forms, you should keep track of the application and the last date for filling. I have known people who have missed the last date for application and they were not able to sit for the entrance examination. That is something that should never happen to you. You should keep track of the applications and the last date for filling and you should fill the forms well in advance because if you have filled something wrong, if the uh, form comes back to you that you have made an error in the form, you should have a buffer to correct it before the last date gets expired. So, that these form problems, these silly mistakes should never happen. Now, apart from uh, now coming to tier 2 topics. So, tier 2 topics as we discussed are selected chapters from Campbell and these chapters we will see in the coming uh, uh, slides what are these selected chapters that you should know in tier 2 topics. But in Campbell review, you should try to cover the whole of Campbell review so that these topics which you are not reading from Campbell, you are at least able to know the important question that can come and you can read about those paragraphs in those uh, tier 2 topics. And again from previous year papers also if some questions have come up from these tier 2 topics, you should be aware of those questions and the uh, theory that is relating to the options in those questions again is important as we discussed. So, we will do a brief chapter wise review in the Campbell. So, the first uh, topic is the clinical decision making. In the routine uh, examination, you should know about urine routine examination, the types of crystals, the colors and odors of urine very important, the bile and uh, fatty acid they usually ask. In the entrance examination, the imaging uh, topic of the Campbell, new modalities of imaging you should be aware of that is the multiparametric MRI for prostate with biparametric MRI and the Pirates version 2 is the new thing in prostate. Virates for bladder cancer very favorable favorite entrance examination question used to be when virates came up. Contragenized ultrasound is the new upcoming thing in ultrasound. Uh, that it is that can be asked in the entrance examination. Now, basics of standard imaging like the phases of CT, the contrast medium, the phases of uh, the frequencies of ultrasound all you should know because these are very simple questions that uh, are very high yield as well. In nuclear imaging, the types of radionuclides used and the types of curves which are there in DTP imaging, you should be aware of that. In basics of urological surgery, urological instruments you can read from the Subnis textbook of instruments. This is again a short book like high yield biostatistics and it is probably a day read. It is crisp and concise and can help you get a hang of. It is uh, well illustrated and I would highly recommend it. Apart from that, you have laparoscopy and robotics in which new robots, the Indian robots, mantra robot, the advantage, disadvantage of robots you should know and the basics of laparoscopy, port placement, the angles in laparoscopy you should be aware of because this is the new uh, adva technological advancement in the field of urology I would say. In energy modalities, types of lasers and their character, especially thulium laser is the latest advance and you should be aware of this. And hemisphere management is the usual question for the next step in management not the best step and the flow chart of hematuria management is well given in the Campbell chapter and you should be aware of that. Coming to pediatric urology, pediatric urology I would say is a tier 2 topic and these topics are out of pediatric urology are the ones which are mainly important, the rest you can do from the MCQs. Vesicoutural reflux and the surgeries for UR are important. PUV you can get the image of the keyhole appearance and the characteristic MCU appearance of the posterior ethyl valve in the examination. Renal cystic disease are again a fact based topic and an MCQ can come from these cystic diseases, especially the new drugs which are used in the treatment of ADPKD. Now, ectopic ureter, uterocele again can be used as an image based topic and hypospadias can be used as a clinical image based topic depending on the types of hypospadias, the levels of hypospadias and what management you can give these patients. Now, undescended testes, the names of the procedures uh, are specially asked in the entrance examination and again a question can come that undescended testes with hypospadias, what will you do? This is usually suggestive of DSG. So, in DSG that is disorder of sexual differentiation, clinical decision making and identifying the type of uh, disorder of sexual differentiation is important in the entrance examination and Wilms tumors and neuroblastoma comprise the main topic that you should know about in pediatric oncology. 
Now coming to infections and inflammation, especially in entrance examination, they ask about special type of renal infection and the primary organism associated with those infections like emphysematous palynephritis, XGPN and malacoplakia. I would also say that they are very uh, important for image based question. They can give you the bare paw appearance of XGPN or they can give the air in the CT in emphysematous palynephritis or they can give the pelvic glacial enhancement or a uh, moth eaten calyx or a uretric stricture or a thickening of the uretric wall in case of TB. That, uh, that can be asked in the image based questions. Again for TB, WHO based management which is the extra pulmonary TB management based on the index guidelines which have come up is important uh, because TB is uh, especially important for the uh, Indian patients. Coming to reproductive and sexual health, uh, anatomy chapters, all chapters in various topics, anatomy of the kidney, adrenals, the pelvis and the genitalia is important in neurology and these are very high yield questions because they are easy to remember and they usually have a single correct answer which is easily answerable. Now in infertility they can ask you clinical scenarios for the cause, so based on the testicular size, based on the hormonal levels, based on the palpation of vas, based on the status of the ejaculatory duct or the truss findings or the semen volume, you can differentiate between various forms of causes of infertility and we will discuss them on the infertility topic but these are usually what is asked in infertility. For erectile dysfunction the new advantage or the new advancement I would say is the lithotripsy for erectile dysfunction and the use of prosthesis. And for priapism it is important to be able to differentiate between ischemic and non-ischemic priapism. Peronis disease is another topic that you should know by heart uh, overall. Now coming to male genitalia, extremely important is the testicular neoplasm, these are extremely high yield because they have protocol based management and the usually you will be having a decision making between various options for management in cases of uh, stages of testicular tumor, you should know them by heart. Again penile cancer is a rare tumor but is very commonly asked especially in AIMS I can tell you. In the entrance examinations very favorite of entrance uh, questions and in urethral structure disease the classification of PFUDDs and the urethral structures can be asked as an image based question, again a basic RGUMC or a normal RGUMC can also be asked by the examiners uh, and you sh uh, should be able to identify the various parts of the urethra that are seen in the RGUMC and we will discuss them as well. Now coming to renal physiology and pathophysiology, I would say that the channels of the nephrons in renal physiology are important, their location and their function are important for the MCQ and the classification and stages of CKD and AKI are important. For renal transplantation, the 12th edition I would say is not very good because it has a very small renal transplantation chapter mainly covering the complications or the urological complications of transplantation and for the uh, overview of renal transplantation, I would advise you to go for the 11th edition reading because that has more comprehensive information and the latest advancement in the field of renal transplantation is a robot assisted renal transplantation. Apart from that they can ask you how to expand the donor pool with the ABO incompatibility or the domino transplant or the um, pair transplantation and apart from that basics of immunosuppression you should be aware of. Now coming to upper urinary tract obstruction and trauma, trauma and the classification of renal trauma and management for that is basically an entrance examination question. Uh, in urinary lithiasis, metabolic abnormalities for stone disease and the clinical scenarios for surgical management. When will you choose PCNL, when will you choose lithotripsy, when will you choose RARS is what can be asked in the entrance question, especially with an image based exam, image based question they can ask you that this is the image, the stone is this, so maybe it is a staggered stone, so what will you do, uh, PCNL will be the answer, so something like that. Again they can ask you in patients having bilateral stones, so which will you treat first, we will discuss that in our topic on surgical management for urinary stones and lithotripsy and the various mechanisms of stone breakage in lithotripsy are important for the entrance examination. Neoplasms of upper urinary tract is again extremely important topic, they are very uh, fond of AML and oncocytoma for entrance, the genetic types of RCC, the, the levels of IBC thrombus and their management and the newest trials in the immunotherapy and tyrosine kinase inhibitor in the newer driven setting and in metastatic RCC. And in upper tract urethral cancer, gelmito is the latest advancement that has come up in the um, field of upper tract urethral cancer. Coming to adrenals, adrenals is again a topic which is a fact based topic and you can read it from Campbell, nothing uh, else is usually required for adrenals. Adrenal anatomy is a very favorite uh, topic for the entrance examination and you should know it by heart. They can ask you that the kidney is absent, so what will happen to the adrenal? So that is usually the question that is asked in the entrance examination. Urine transport storage and emptying again I would say is a tier 2 topic and a limited number of chapters from this 
uh, sub part of the Campbell are important mainly being the pharmacology for urinary incontinence out of which Mira background is the latest addition. Uh, basics of urodynamic and urophilometry especially the types of urophilometry curves and what they suggest can be asked as an image based question. Female stress incontinence and the types of surgeries for female stress incontinence are important for entrance and artificial urethral sphincter and atoms device and other devices for male stress urinary incontinence can be asked. For urinary fistula they can ask clinical scenarios like you have the patient who is having contest urinary incontinence what is likely the cause, the patient who is having uh, normal wedding along with incontinence what can be the cause. So, these type of clinical scenarios can come with urinary fistula. Now, coming to benign and malignant bladder disorders, you cannot ignore it, you need to be thoroughly aware of all the guidelines for non-muscle invasive, muscle invasive bladder cancer, the new trials for immunotherapy for bladder cancer, you need to be thoroughly aware of checkpoint inhibitors and images of types of urinary diversion are usually not asked, but they are a possibility. Prostate is I would say the most important topic of the whole Campbell is prostate for entrance examination. Now, prostate secretion is a factual chapter, you can not do anything but remember it. For BPH, you have trials of medications like MTROP trials and combat trial and the new endoscopic management and their images like TUMT, TUNA, RISM, aquablation I would say is the favorite of the question masters, you should be aware of them and thulium laser is the latest advancement in the endoscopic management of BPH and that again is a favorite topic. For prostate cancer, biomarkers, the various PSA and PSA associated biomarkers, the FI score, the 4K score, the mitomic test, the decipher score, these are extremely important. The MRI guided biopsy, cognitive fusion biopsy and the uh, fusion software based MRI biopsy and the pirate score extremely important and they can be used as an image based question as well. Management of carcinoma prostate, especially the metastatic carcinoma prostate and the newest drugs and trials for uh, hormone sensitive carcinoma prostate which is metastatic and CRPC both are extremely important and uh, it would do well to remember the whole prostate topics because I feel that it is extremely important. So, in the end I would only impart the advice that we need to do smart reading, we do not need to do the whole Campbell, but we need to do the important topics, we need to do the previous year chapters, uh, the previous year question papers and we need to do statistics and we need to do a mock test which is extremely important. We need to be careful about the time. You should always have a clock in hand or a watch with you when you are doing the entrance examination because you do not want to run out of time. Always aim for at least 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, you want to finish your question paper at least 10 to 15 minutes before the time ends and you want to make sure that you exclude all the options and answer as many questions as possible. Good luck.